Well, I want to welcome all of you. If you're joining us online, so thankful that you're joining in. Maybe you're new here. Bethany Christian Church is one church meeting at multiple locations. So we have a campus in Vincennes, and we're going to be opening up a brand new campus in Princeton at the Showplace Cinema. In two weeks, we have our soft launch, and in six weeks, we open that up just so it becomes a permanent place, a permanent campus there for Princeton and Gibson County and anybody who wants to have a great, strong church congregation will be opening up in Princeton on October the 24th. Josh Brown, I saw you in here earlier. Where are you at? Stand up, would you? Josh is leading that campus as our campus pastor. Yeah, awesome. And uh, next week is a special time in our church where we have a moment where we call it Ascending Sunday, where we'll be praying over um, Josh and his team, our staff team that's heading down there, our launch team and our plant team, those folks that are going to be calling that church their home, and uh, our prayer teams as well. We're excited because Bethany Christian Church is not just about its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. We have an incredible message, a message that has put us on mission, a message of Jesus Christ being crucified who brings us hope to the hopeless, life to those that believe that all there is in life is death, who extend grace, that message extends grace to those that are reeling from the chains and hurts and the paths of yesterday that they can break through them, a message that extends love to those that believe they're abandoned and have no compassion in their life, a message that brings victory to those that feel defeated. It's an incredible message of salvation that links us to our God and removes our sin from us. Friends, let's not forget the important message that we have of Jesus Christ. Let's not forget about the hope that we have to a lost and dying world that is very hopeless today. And when I say hopeless today, and when I talk about a lost and dying world, when I speak of people who are in spiritual darkness, friends, some of you, that is your spouse, that's your kids or grandkids. It could be a distant relative or a friend that's close to you. It could be a stranger that you meet in the store. It could be a coworker. But there are so many folks that are living disconnected from God who are living without the hope that you have today. And I pray that you see those folks as just as much value as God sees you and as he sees them. This is a place where we gather. It's not just a place where we gather though. It's a place where we go. And we go out with a great and glorious message of Jesus Christ. And I want you to become like this search party that brings a lot of hope and happiness to a lost traveler in the woods. Anybody that's lost loves to be found. It's a feeling of relief. And I pray that your feet, your voice, you're a sight for sore eyes. Just as the scriptures say in Romans chapter 10, it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hey, you might think that you are too far gone, that you're too far lost, that you're too far separated from God. No, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one who they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Friend, you're being sent with the great news of Jesus Christ as it's written. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And the Apostle Paul who wrote that was saying to folks like you and me that the message that we have, a hope-filled message, a salvation message, should be a beautiful message and people should look to you as a welcome into their life more than anything else. I have this little plaque that was given to me by some ladies that help volunteer in the office. It says, everyone who enters this office brings joy, some when they enter and others when they leave. And maybe that is for you in your life. There's some people in your life that bring you joy some when they enter and some when they leave. I want all of us with the life-giving message of Jesus to be the ones that are welcomed into the relationship because we bring them such great joy because we've come with good news that they can have peace with God. What do you think about that, church? So here's the central question for today. And this central question really leads us to what Jesus is getting after in the text that we're gonna look at. Who could you not imagine spending eternity without? Think through that for a second. Who could you not imagine spending eternity without? Who in your life is disconnected from God? Maybe in spiritual darkness or as the Bible refers to them as lost. So who in your life, if they were to die today, would die without accepting Jesus? Who is that? Would you just kind of park that person right here in your heart? Would you just keep them at the forefront of your mind as we talk about this message today? 
Because Jesus summed up his mission like this. He said, for the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. Will you repeat that out loud with me? For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus says he's come to seek and to save. And who's he come to seek and save? Well, that word is the lost. You guys know that old familiar hymn, Amazing Grace. I was lost, but now I'm found. I'm blind, but now I see. That comes from the words of Jesus to describe those that are far removed and disconnected from God, who are spiritually blinded and are in some kind of darkness spiritually. Jesus titles them the lost. It's not a term that's to disparage anybody. It's not a term that's to harm anybody. It's a term to refer to value of somebody. Now, you may not have thought about this, but anything lost, you want to find. Otherwise, it doesn't make anything much of anything. Anything that has some kind of value that is lost, you want to track it down. And it goes for anything. I mean, you may not pay attention too much to a lost water bottle. I mean, you think to yourself, well, I won't think twice about that. I lost it. Big deal. There's more water bottles. But you'll think twice when you lose the remote control. You'll flip over the couch, turn over the cushions, and let's just say you never find it. What do you do? Eventually you'll say, well, it will turn up somewhere. This last Easter, uh, I'd come to uh, park at Jones and Sons to reserve space for the extra attendance we'd have on Easter. And I was walking down the highway 57 at about five o'clock in the morning. I was fiddling with my fob, my key fob. And between here and there, I I must have lost it. Because after services, I couldn't get back in my car. Finally got a ride back to uh, eat some Easter dinner. But right afterwards, I had a full search party. My, my family, my kids, I got them out on the highway in the ditches. And I said, we're going to find my key fob today. Now, we never, we never found it. And so Monday, I went out and looked again. And the whole week, I looked for that dumb key fob. And I never found the key fob to my, to my car. And what I've discovered is the value of something lost is determined by the intensity you search with. Like you won't think twice about losing a bottle of water, but losing a key fob, you're gonna really search hard for. How about your wallet? You ever lost your wallet or your phone? You don't go anywhere. You don't go anywhere until you find one or both of those items. You ever lost a kid? (laughs) Yeah, we lost our youngest uh, a couple months ago, four years old. We were having a huge party at our house. It was starting to get dark and uh, my my wife finally, because it's always my wife who notices. I never notice if we have a kid or not. When you got five, you're like, yeah. She says, Where, where's Jackson? And our stomachs just kind of dropped out and we're all having a party. And, you know, I'm like, oh, wh- wh- where is he? And we kind of all stop. And I'm like, okay, the party's over. I'm knocking chips and salsa out of people's mouths. I'm like, no more party. We're now a search party. And I'm sending people, you go check the woods. You go check the neighbors. You go check the ditch. You go just go, you just go search everywhere. And finally about 15, 20 minutes went by and we couldn't find this kid until finally somebody said, here he is right here. Where was he? in an unlocked car, pretending like he was driving, clueless that the rest of the neighborhood was panicking that we were searching for. Now listen, you don't stop everything and go search for a water bottle. You don't go and stop everything and get your neighbors together and go search for your remote control. You won't even do that for your key fob, but you'll do it for a kid. You'll do it for your child. And when Jesus says that the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. He is saying that God is searching for his kids and he is seeking hard because you're valuable to him because the lost means you're disconnected and the value of something lost is determined by the intensity you search for it and the intensity of God was so great that he sent his one and only son to come into harm's way to search for us. And here's the challenge today. Two things. One is that you understand the incredible value that God has on a soul the incredible priceless value that God has on a soul, your soul included and those that are disconnected from him right now. And two, that you will adopt the same value of a soul, that you will adopt the passion and the compassion and the, the, the vigor it takes to go after even one person that is far removed and disconnected from God. I wanna refer you back to three stories that Jesus tells about the heartbeat that God has for people that are lost and disconnected from him. Turn with me to Luke chapter 15. It's page 849 in the Bible. That's in the chair rack in front of you. You can catch it there online as it's being posted into the chat. You can just click on that. That will probably take you to to Bible Gateway and you can get to Luke chapter 15. There's three stories about the lost that are found 
I want to talk about two of them, and then I want to read the middle one, which is called the parable of the lost coin. The first story Jesus tells is called the parable of the lost sheep. It's about a shepherd that has 100 sheep but loses one. He leaves 99 that are together in the fold of protection in the wilderness, and he risks the 99 to go and give the one protection by leading them back to the fold so that they can be complete and whole again. And when he does that, he celebrates and he gets everyone else to celebrate with him. There's a big party that happens. And the last story that Jesus tells about lostness is called the prodigal son. It's the story of the lost boy, the one who goes to his dad and demands his inheritance and then takes that money and leaves the house and leaves uh, his known country and spends that money wildly on things that have no meaning whatsoever. And he finds himself broke financially and broken spiritually. And he finds himself in a place where he has nothing. And he comes to his senses and he says, I know it's better to be back at home with my dad. And he wanders back home and his dad has been waiting on him. And his dad goes running out to meet him in a, in a way to say, I thought you were dead, but now you're alive. I thought you were lost, but now you are found. He reinstates him as a son and he brings him back into the household and he celebrates and he throws a giant party. And here's the story of the lost coin that I wanna focus on today because it shows you the value of a lost soul. It says in verse eight, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Now, some of us would say, what's the big deal? I've got nine, I'm still coming out okay. Now, there was something more than just the value of the coin. We're gonna find that there was something sentimental of attachment to it. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls to her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I found the lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now the story of the lost sheep and the story of the lost coin and the story of the lost son might all sound the same. That something is lost and someone is trying to find it. And when they return home, there's a giant celebration. But each story carries with it, it's any kind of like own intricacies that go along. And even though they're kind of playing the same music and a part of the same orchestra, they're three different instruments. And uh, the story of the lost coin really brings home an understanding of the value that a lost soul has to God and that should have to us. And I think everything that lost, lost something. Let me, let me give you an example of what I'm meaning here. The lost sheep, the lost sheep, not just lost a shepherd, the lost sheep lost protection. It was by itself and it was alone and it was vulnerable. The lost sheep lost protection. You know what the lost coin lost? The lost coin lost its potential. If you lose a hundred dollar bill, it's still worth a hundred dollars. But if you never use that bill to buy anything, it doesn't really have any real value. It lost its potential. It loses its potential value. What did the lost son lose? The lost son lost his position. He was no longer a son. He asked for his inheritance and walked away. He lost his position. And I think each story can represent something. That there are times when we are lost and we lose our protection from God. We're lost and we lose our potential that we find in God. We're lost and we lose our standing with God, our, our position with God. There's also a side of these stories that weighs in that theologians have talked about for uh, centuries is that each story represents a part of the tr Trinity of God. Now I know I'm getting a little deep here, but there's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Spirit, and those three make up one God. Now I can't completely explain that, but I can't completely explain the mysteries of God either to you, and if I think I could, you would probably see me as a charlatan, and that kind of God that's easily explainable probably isn't worth worshiping. And so here's the trinity of God that's found in Luke 15. It's the shepherd who is Jesus, who goes and seeks and saves the lost, leaving the 99 behind, risking his life to save the one, you and me. Here's the woman who theologians have often said that is the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the church, and that's you and I, that compels us to move and get serious about looking for those who have value to God, the lost. And then there is the Father, who is our Heavenly Father, who not only waits for those patiently to return home, but eagerly goes out to them to receive them so that they can be restored as sons and daughters of the kingdom. 
I, I don't know about all that. But one thing I do know that this lady had lost something and she found it and she had looked and looked because it was valuable to her. Friends, how valuable are the lost souls in your life to you? You see, those who are disconnected from God are extremely valuable to him. That's what you need to understand today. Those who are disconnected from God, those who are lost are extremely valuable to God. Let me just explain it to you in a simple verse that we know so well. John chapter three, verse 16. On the screen, it says, for God loved the world in this way. Let's just read it out loud together, this second part. He gave his one and only son, so everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now you see that underlined word there, perish. Sometimes it's translated lost. Sometimes it's translated lose. Sometimes it's translated perish. But it all comes from the same Greek word, which is apollomy. And apollomy is really the word destroy. That he has come so that anyone who believes in Jesus will not be destroyed, but have eternal life. It's actually a title that, that is given to Satan in the book of Revelation. Apollomy, a title for Satan. He is the destroyer that wants to come to see, steal, kill, and destroy. Apollomy. And really, that title is appendage there in Revelation to say, be aware that just as Christ Jesus is seeking you out to save you, Satan is seeking out to destroy you. Let me just give you three ways Satan tries to destroy those who are lost. Three ways that the Bible tells us that Satan tries to destroy and blind us so that we will not uh, find God. One, uh, the lost are disconnected from God. That's one way he tries to, they just, he just disconnects us so that we feel that gaping hole that we're lost and abandoned and unloved or whatever that feeling is. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine kind of gives us a glimpse though into the passion of our God who seeks and saves people. It says, the Lord isn't slow in keeping his promises as some people think he is. In fact, actually, God is patient. God is patient. You ever thought about that? That God's patient with you right now and God's patient with the one that is lost right now. He's giving them a chance. He's giving them a moment of grace to come and to accept Jesus. In fact, God is patient because he wants everyone to turn from sin and no one to be, there's that word apolemy, lost to be destroyed. He doesn't want anybody to be destroyed. So God's desire is to save you and others from their sins so you won't spend the rest of eternity apart and disconnected. So one of the ways that Satan tries to destroy you is to just get disconnected from God. Here's the second way. The lost are deceived. Deceived. When I, when I was lost, I was deceived. I was deceived about who God was. I was afraid to come to God because I thought God, when I announced that I was here and that I finally found him or he found me, that I was gonna be exposed, that he was gonna punish me, kind of like a, a little boy who has done something wrong in secret and thinks that his parents know and his parents are gonna punish him. That's how I felt, like worthless and like nothing real meaningful in my life happening, no real value, a disconnect from God, like my identity was stolen, kind of forgot who I was. That's what Satan does to those that are lost. He destroys them by deceiving them about things that aren't real about them and they're not real about God who loves them. And there's a third thing that Satan does. He he puts them on a detour. The lost are detoured. Like God has a path for us and a plan for us, but the lost are put on a different path. They're put on a different plan that's contrary to God's. And it's one that we think is right, but in the end, it's gonna lead to death. And that's why Satan has this like shiny apple of a kind of an idea that he leads us into temptation and it leads us right into a pit, a pit of sin and a pit of despair. And I love what the scriptures have to say. It says every single one of us has been there. Every single one of us has been disconnected. Every single one of us has been deceived. All of us have been on this path of detour. It says it like this in Romans, for everyone has sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. You know what that word sin is? That means to miss the mark. That God has established some spiritual laws in this world. Just like there's laws of science, God has established spiritual laws. And you're saying, well, what are those laws? 
Do you know all the laws written in the United States uh, law books? No, you probably don't. Have you broken many of them? Probably have. You just weren't aware of it. God says, listen, it doesn't matter if you've done it out of ignorance or if you've done it on purpose. If you break a spiritual law, you have to pay the fine. You know what the fine is for breaking a spiritual law? The, the fine is death. And you can pay it or you can accept God's pardon, Jesus Christ. Now, now the choice is yours. Uh, Jesus Christ has made himself known. The pardon is free. It's just about accepting the pardon. But there are so many that say, I refuse the pardon. I would prefer to pay. And God says, well, then if you prefer to pay, you got to go to a place called hell. Uh, some of you call that city hall. God calls it hell. And friends, just so you're aware, hell isn't a place that God sends people whom he is mad at. It's a place where you go to pay for your sins because you have decided that you'd pay for them rather than accept the pardon. And here's the catch 22 about paying for your own sins rather than receiving the pardon of Jesus Christ. It's a forever payment. It's, it's consistent and eternal disconnect from God. And friends, God has all this enormous compassion for you. He has enormous compassion for those that are lost because he doesn't want that disconnect to be eternal from him. And that's why he sent Jesus on this rescue mission to seek and to save those who are lost. And friends, it cost Jesus everything he had, including his very life. And so let me state it to you like this. Those who are lost are worth the cost. That's what God told us. Isn't that what Jesus tells us? That those who are lost are worth this cost. What are they cost? What, what's, what is the soul, the lost one worth to you? Because to God, there, there couldn't be a price tag on it. It was more than just monetary value. It was sentimental. These are my kids. You ever lost a kid? Jesus says, yeah. God says, yes. And I sent my very son as a payment to search for them. You know, when the woman, woman searched the house, and lost her coin. It was more than just like a, a monetary thing that she was searching after. It was, it was a, a coin, a set of 10. Uh, Jesus refers to this in the story. If this woman were a Jewish woman, uh, she would have wore a headband that would have had 10 coins on it. It would have signified that she was married or engaged. It represented like a wedding ring. And if ever a bride or a fiance ever lost their engagement ring, they would be crushed by it because it'd have so much more sentimental value than when it'd have monetary value to her. And this coin was, was sentimental to her. And that's why she flips the house over. That's why she goes on such a great search. Hey, who, who is priceless in your book? When I asked that question earlier about heaven or hell, about who those were lost and disconnected, that soul that popped up into your mind, that person that came to mind, how much is that person worth to you? Are they worth putting your vacation on hold for? Are they worth emptying your bank account for? Are they worth giving up your life for? I mean, like, where, where do they stand? Because I think all of us would say, if we were to ask, what is a soul worth to us? We'd all say, well, a soul is priceless. But then if they're priceless, how far would you go for that one to come back? to a savior who loves him. And so let me just speak to, to three groups that I, I would assume are in this room and listening online and in our venue at the fireside room. Let me speak to those that are strong spiritually, who are struggling spiritually, and who are stuck spiritually. To you that you feel that you're strong spiritually, friend, to hold back the life-saving message of Jesus Christ from anybody in your life right now is like holding back water from someone who is dying of thirst. It's cruel, it's torturous. To not have the life-giving message on your lips at any given moment for those who are strong in your faith and who are bold in your faith, it is almost cowardice to say that you are strong and not be a proclaimer of God's word. To those that are struggling right now, the world would say to you, if you're struggling spiritually, to focus on yourself, to work on yourself, to get healthy, don't play hurt, remove yourself from the field, and then once you're ready, you can get back and you'll be strong. You know, there was no hero of the faith that ever believed that. Every hero of the faith that you find in the scriptures played hurt. They walked with a limp and they played hurt. And they got back out there 
And they recognized that even in their weakness, God could do something incredibly strong through them. And when they walked in weakness, God would become the undeniable strength of their life and people saw it. Let me put it to you like this. Let your test that you're going through today be a testimony to those around you. May your struggle be your story that leads people to your savior. And I can't, it's hard to say that without thinking of Beth and Brett Graber. Some of you know who they are. Uh, uh, Brett works for the Bar Reef School Corporation. Um, They both attend the Washington campus here. Beth has been diagnosed with cancer. She has been fighting cancer for years. Uh, She's had some complications right now with, with COVID. She's now being hospitalized. And Beth and Brett have been so faithful in proclaiming the gospel message in their struggle. Their test has become a testimony to doctors and nurses and to house cleaners and and to cafeteria workers that are walking to their room and people that have dealt with her medically and who have come to, to her side just to try to encourage her. They've all walked away encouraged because they have not let themselves get under the circumstances of life. They've put themselves in the, in the place of who Christ is and they've pointed everything back to God. And they have become a great testament, even though they're wrung out emotionally, even though they're wrung out physically, they haven't let their struggle stop them from pointing people to an all-sufficient Savior. And if you're struggling today in your faith, it's time that you learn to use your test as a testimony, your struggle as a story, to point people to an all-sufficient Savior. And if you're stuck in your faith, and I'd classify that as anybody that is disconnected from God, that is lost today, Why are you hiding from God? There is nothing to fear. He wants to embrace you, give you grace and restore you as a son, just like these stories in Luke 15 have told us. And I know that so many of us have the opposite viewpoint. We see it that God is lost and we're trying to find God or we're trying to pursue God. God's not lost. God's been pursuing you for a very long time. You know, when I play hide and seek with my little kids, my little kids, it's so easy not to be found. I mean, I'll just hide behind the couch and they'll never notice. And the goal of hide and seek is to hide and not be found, but not to hide forever. I mean, if that was the case, I'd still be behind the couch right now. So sooner or later, what do you do when you've hidden too good? You make a noise. You push the couch around and they come and find you and you say, oh, shoot, you found me. Because there's gotta be an end to the game because hiding is no fun after a certain point. And you know that. Hiding is no fun and God is pursuing you and he's giving you opportunity after opportunity. God has made himself known. He's made himself through nature. He's made himself through, known through general revelation, nature and special revelation like the scriptures and through the preaching and teaching of his word. God has spoken to you in many ways, I guarantee it. Whether you've just kind of felt that in your heart or have had some kind of dream, God has made himself known to you. How long are you gonna hide from him? And I love what the scripture has to say. It says, but God showed how much he loved us by having Christ die for us, even though we were sinful. He didn't wait for you to get better. He didn't wait for you to stop sinning. What are you afraid of? God wants to embrace you right now. He wants to embrace you in your mess. He wants to embrace you in your sin. He wants to embrace you in that condition of lostness. And he wants to restore you to be a son and a daughter of his own. And in Luke 15, It teaches us that the soul is valuable. That's what Jesus teaches us. But here's what it also teaches us. That being lost doesn't last forever. It doesn't have to last forever. That's what I discovered in my own life. That being lost doesn't have to last forever. And maybe you're thinking of someone right now that you just go, you know what? I can't ever see them being a Christian. I can't ever see them responding to God. I mean, they're just so far gone. No, no, no. No one is so far gone. And that's what Jesus is teaching You keep seeking the lost and you keep steering them back to an all-sufficient savior. I grew up in Southern California. I grew up in the backyard of Disneyland, basically, about 10 minutes away. We had annual passes, so we were there all the time. And uh, my mom, who is probably gonna be here at third service, she could attest to this, that as a kid, I was lost at Disneyland nearly every single time we went. And I knew exactly where to go, right down Main Street to City Hall. And you'd sit on this little bench and they'd almost know me by name, the cast members. They said, Matt, you lost again? And no matter how many times I would wander off there and no matter how many times that I couldn't find my parents, they always found me. I was lost. They knew where they were at. 
and they were on the search. And it's sobering to think of my own soul that once I was lost, but now I was found. I was blind, but now I'm seen. That I was once disconnected, but now I'm connected to God. And I think some of us have been found for so long, we forgot the feeling of lostness. And we've had spiritual sight for so long, we forgot what it's like to be blind. And that there are people in this world today that don't have the same hope that you have and they need you to go to them to, to seek them out and to steer them to an all-sufficient savior. Can I tell you how aggressive this woman was in this house to find that lost coin that was so sentimental and valuable to her? Let me give you four ways in which she just turned over the house, filled it with light, got on her hands and knees. People thought she was crazy. You know that, right? People thought she was crazy if they looked into her house, seeing all that she was doing. And if this story truly represents the Holy Spirit, if it truly represents how the Holy Spirit compels his church to go and seek the lost, l- listen how what she does can apply to us today. Here's number one, first thing she did. She lit up the house and filled it with light. She illuminated the house so there was no darkness found within it. So nothing could be hidden in the shadows. Jesus says this about himself. He says, the true light, that light gives light to everyone. Hey, it, the Holy Spirit illuminates our own life. It illuminates the imperfections that we have and drives out the darkness within us. But friends, can I tell you how, uh, how amazing it is for someone who's in darkness to see a little bit of light, to see some hope and to see some grace and to see some love and to see someone speak positively about a world that seems to be going so negatively. People need you to be the light of their world. They need you to be a city on a hill that can't be hidden. And so you can show your good deeds and people can praise your father in heaven. She lit up the house. Whose life are you gonna illuminate today by being Jesus to them? Here's the second thing. She swept the house. She, she just made a complete clean. She just clean. Everything must get cleaned up. Like she, hey, she loves losing coins because the house got clean, I guess. The Holy Spirit comes into our life. And, and though we're not sinless, it sanctifies us so that it becomes that we're sinning less and less. And we're becoming more like Jesus today than we were ever than yesterday. There's a parable that Jesus has, a story that Jesus has about the Holy Spirit coming to clean us up and sweeping out the house to purify us of our sins. Friends, there's folks in your life that you need to get your life together with right now. You need to get back on mission for Christ and live yielding to the Spirit, living on mission for Jesus because they need you. They need to hear from you. They need you to illuminate their life and they need you to see what it looks like to be someone who is saved and embraced by God. What does that life look like and how different it is than their own? Here's the third thing. She searched carefully. She knew exactly what she was after. She had nine coins. She had them counted. She was missing one. She had to find that one. That name that came to mind earlier. Who is that person that you need to be determined to go after, to search for carefully, to be strategic in your words, strategic to your invites to church? Who is that? Here's the fourth thing. She didn't give up. She never gave up. She was persistent. She probably had a thousand things to do that day, but every single one of them got pushed down the list because the most important thing to do was to find the thing that was sentimental to her that was lost. How important is this soul that is lost in your life to you? You know, I love how these parables end. If you look at every parable, all three of them, lost sheep, lost coin, lost sheep, they they all end in celebration. Did you notice that? I love the story of the lost coin. Here's how it ends. It's on the screen. She calls her friends and neighbors together. Isn't that great? Like it was a personal search, but like she can't contain herself. It's because what was lost is found. She calls her friends and neighbors together and she says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. You know, this just tells me three stories about lost being found that God likes to party. You probably don't picture God that way, but he loves to celebrate. He loves to party. It goes on to say in verse 10 in the same way. I'll tell you that there's rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Like that party that you see from the shepherd and from the woman who lost the coin to that father who thought he lost his son but regained him back. That same celebration, in a sense, is happening in heaven when one lost soul comes back 
and gets their position restored as a son or daughter in, in God. Uh, guys, I know what we're talking about today has like enormous challenges. It's gonna, it's gonna ask you to be bold in your faith. It's gonna ask you to just speak the words of God to somebody. It's gonna make you nervous. You're gonna be embarrassed at times. You're not know, gonna know exactly what to say. There's so many challenges, but friend, let, let, let the celebration override the challenges. What I'm saying is there's risk, but the, but the reward is greater than the risk. And, and I'm praying for you this week that as you go and you start to seek and to steer that, that one to an all-sufficient savior, that they have a softened heart and that you have a, that you, that you have a bold life. And let me just say for anybody that's disconnected here, disconnected from God and are lost, like the lost sheep, I think you can naturally wander off. Like the lost coin, I think that you can just get lost by circumstances. Like the lost son, I think you can get lost by your own rebellious heart. Which lost are you? Because a savior stands and waits for you and runs and pursues you. And some are you running from God today and God is pursuing you and he's chasing after you how long are you gonna stay hidden? I love what God has to say to the prophet Ezekiel. He says, I will search for my lost ones who strayed away and I will bring them safely home again. I will bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. He doesn't wanna just, just doesn't wanna just find you. He wants to restore you and strengthen you. Friends, it amazes me that the God who created everything and absolutely needs nothing considers you valuable. And don't let anyone ever tell you that you have no value to God. You're so valuable that he risks his own son's life. You're so valuable that God sent his one and only son that whoever believes in Jesus will no longer be lost, will no longer be destroyed but have eternal life with God. Do you believe that church? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, today we come to you. Would you give us a renewed heart for those that are lost? A renewed heart like your son shows us that the shepherd had and this woman had and the father has for the things that were lost in their life. May we have a new heartbeat and a new passion for those in our family and those in our friend circles and, and those with whom we work who are disconnected from you. May they burden our life. And may we speak up and be bold about the hope that we have. And we pray for those that we're thinking of now that are lost, that you soften their heart, that as we extend an invite or as we speak spiritual truths into their life filled with grace, that they'll be responding to those and they'll recognize the love that we have for them, but more importantly, the love that you have for them. And may they, may they not stay hidden any longer, but they come to embrace and accept your son, Jesus, the savior, of our soul. And we pray these things in his powerful name and the church says in one voice, amen.